Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining us this morning to talk about future vertical lift. Uh, before we get started, let me take care of the, uh, of, of the uh, obligations that we have at all our events uh, before I get into the meat of, of this fascinating topic. Uh, let me just give our security announcement for all our events. We just like to remind folks that uh, we're in a nice, secure facility here, but nothing is as secure as it could possibly be. And so uh, if anything were to happen, uh, uh, I will be your security officer. I'll give directions about where to go. And most, most likely, we would head out the back here and out into uh, a safe location over by the National Geographic Building. Uh, if that were to become necessary, I'll let you know, and there'll be the voice of God coming through the speakers. But uh, uh, in all likelihood, we will have uh, an event that will not be eventful in that sense, but it will be eventful, I think, on the substance. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, our sponsors. Uh, this, this future vertical lift series is uh, sponsored by uh, Bell and Textron, uh, and so we want to thank them for making this series uh, possible. Uh, today we're going to talk uh, again about future vertical lift, and as I mentioned, this is part of a, a broader series uh, of events that have been looking at this question of uh, what's the future of vertical lift, uh, where are things going, and I, I'm really excited, actually I've been waiting uh, for, for many months to have today's event uh, where we're going to talk about uh, a requirement for future vertical lift that has been wending its way through the Pentagon uh, and actually has gotten approval. And so. Uh, we're at a stage where rather than just talking about it, people are getting uh, now uh, deeply into uh, beginning to execute programs. Uh, so that's a major step. It's, it's what we want to focus on today. Uh, we've got uh, a, an all-star uh, cast from the services here to, uh, to make us smarter about this. Uh, to my right is Colonel Erskine Bentley, uh, United States Army. He's the TRADOC Capability Manager for Future Vertical Lift. Uh, he has uh, had a number of command positions uh, in the Army and aviation um, and uh, has been the air requirements uh, branch chief uh, as well as uh, ground requirements branch chief at SOCOM. So he's got, uh, uh, he's, a, he's a dual threat at least, perhaps, perhaps more. Uh, to his right is Colonel John Barranco. Did I, did I pronounce that correctly? Barranco. Barranco. From the United States Marine Corps, uh, currently assigned to Headquarters Marine Corps Aviation. Uh, as the Aviation Requirements Branch Head. Uh, he has uh, previously served as Executive Officer to uh, General Kelly. Uh, and if you are like me and you have your uh, U.S. Marine Corps Cabinet bingo sheet at home, um, uh, I've determined you can pretty much staff the entire Cabinet with uh, former Marine officers. Uh, I'm going to pencil you in, John, as a future Secretary of Transportation, if that's, if that's okay with you. <laughs> Uh, and uh, in all seriousness, so he has a, a lot of experience, uh, obviously, in aviation and instructor pilot uh, and uh, uh, Naval Academy graduate. Uh, and to his right is Colonel David Phillips, uh, who's here, uh, who is a PEO for Rotary Ring at SOCOM, uh, is a test pilot, and also trained as a program manager, so an another dual threat uh, joining us. And uh, with that, uh, we're going to start with the Army, which is the lead service for, uh, for, the, for the activity that's underway. Uh, and then we'll hear a little bit from the other uh, two uh, panelists, and then we'll go into Q&A. But uh, Colonel Bentley, over to you. Great. Thank you. Uh, good morning. First of all, uh, sincere appreciation to CSIS for putting on this event, and also you, Mr. Hunter, and Ms. Johnson also. Uh, as we look at the future are the future vertical lift family of systems. You know, that encompasses the entire DOD vertical lift inventory, uh, from our smallest training helicopter to our largest cargo helicopter. And really what we've done is we've taken a mission systems approach to defining our requirements for the vertical lift family of systems. Uh, we have department and service equities across that system. But as we look at the Army requirements, and specifically for capability set three, we see that the greatest joint need across the services is for a capability set three aircraft. And so that's our intent to go after a cape set three first. Uh, specifically for the Army, we're looking at a utility mission. This utility mission um, involves medevac capabilities. It involves our air assault capability, the uh, ability to assault light forces and their equipment, and also involves troop movement. Um, 
as we also look at what the Army requirements are, we look at the reach, um, protection, and also the lethality of FVL aircraft. When we talk about reach, we're looking at the power, the speed, range, and endurance of FVL, and specifically Cape Set 3. Uh, this enables the Army to conduct strategic deployment, and once we arrive in theater at a place and time of need, it allows us to immediately go into operations. So it's about strategic deployability with tactical employment once we arrive. The other thing that, um, about REACH is it gives us maneuverability and agility in and around the objective area. As we look at protection, FVL speed and range also enables us um, some additional protection for the force, not only for the aircraft, but also for the occupants and the force in general. The speed and range of FVL coupled with, you know, advanced uh, survivability equipment, sensors, and other equipment enables us to increase the protection of our force. As we look at the uh, lethality of FVL, once again, the speed and range coupled with sensors, lightweight precision munitions, is going to increase the lethality of Army aviation and uh, vertical lift aviation in the joint force. We spent uh, quite a few years developing our requirements, and we still have a, a long way to go. We're just kind of, you know, scratching the surface on developing our initial requirements. Um, but really what we have is a well-informed decision-based plan of execution. We have a very large investment in S&T that's informing capability set three and FVL. We're looking at different ways of manufacturing using different materials, um, advanced technologies for vertical lift, and we're also looking at the opportunity to use a modular open systems architecture in FVL aircraft that could be common across the family. Um, but we've done a lot of work getting to where we are. We have a lot of work to do uh, even before we start refining our requirements and before we start writing production re requirements for FVL. Um, but the Army's excited about Capability Set 3. Uh, we're definitely excited about leading the multi-service team for FVL development and specifically Capability Set 3. Uh, and we're looking forward to the future. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, Colonel Barranco, please. Well, good morning, and uh, thanks for having us here today. Um, Andrew mentioned I'm a Naval Academy grad. He didn't tell you, Colonel Phillips is actually a West Point grad. So, I don't know if you guys know, there's a little game tomorrow, so maybe, maybe you heard something about that. Is there a wager? Uh, not yet, but, but we'll see. Um, a great opening by Colonel Bentley, and uh, you know, I agree with everything that he said. Y you look at what's the need and the, the impetus behind the future vertical lift family of systems. Uh, probably a lot of you saw recently uh, articles about the America deployment that the Marine Corps did with F-35. You look at F-35 across the joint force, across the three services, you look at F-22. We're fielding and have fielded fifth generation fighters. And it's important, we need that. We need a fifth generation fighter attack aircraft, strike aircraft. With the exception of the Osprey, when you look across rotary wing, which makes up the majority of our flying force and the joint force, we haven't really seen any large technical advances in aircraft since third generation, second or third generation. I mean, really since Vietnam, what massive technical leap, despite all the technical progress we've seen the last generation, have we really seen in rotary wing vertical lift aircraft? with the exception of the Osprey, which is a very small portion. Uh, it's kind of a shocking assertion when you think about it. Uh, so the need, both for industry and across the joint force, uh, to leverage technology and to develop new, more capable aircraft uh, has never been larger. Right? When you look at the threat out there today, you, know, you hear a lot about uh, anti-access aerial denial, A2AD systems, for a variety of you know, potential peer competitors that the U.S. Uh, plans for, plans to compete against. Uh, our assembly areas, our rear areas, are going to have to be farther away from the action, from the flot, than they ever have been before. They're going to have to be. 
you know, have to be. Our ability to penetrate, to get close to where the action is, is going to be limited. It's going to be limited by those systems. That's one of the reasons we've invested in our fifth generation uh, strike TAC air aircraft. So that's going to take range and speed to be able to range back and forth from those assembly areas to the flot. You know, along the flot, I think you've all heard, we talk a lot about distributed operations. We're going to have smaller, more capable, more lethal, more networked, net-centric forces. And they're going to be distributed more widely in smaller groupings across that flot. Uh, but that's not, we're never going to get away from, you know, the Clausewitzian concept of, at the decisive moment, we're still going to need to mass our forces and bring them to bear. And that also is going to require that we have vertical lift systems that give us additional speed, additional range, and of course, lethality and survivability. Um, very excited to be participating in this with the Army, uh, the Army-led multi-service program. Uh, as Colonel Bentley said, uh, we're still in the early stages, uh, but what we're finding is uh, with Cape Set 3 Future Vertical Lift, <coughs> uh, we have a lot more in common with the needs that we've identified um, across the services, SOCOM, Army, and Marine Corps, uh, than differences. Uh, so very excited about being part of it. Uh, I think we've already put a lot of time, a lot of effort, and most importantly, money <laughs> towards it. Uh, we're looking forward to successfully uh, deploying uh, Cape Set 3 as the first of a large uh, future vertical lift family of systems. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Colonel. And then uh, pulling up the, uh, our rear guard is uh, Colonel Phillips from SOCOM. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. I'd like to start out by saying um, if you first get a call from somebody that says, hey, come sit on a panel up in Washington, D.C., and right before Christmas with a lot of experts, and a lot of those experts are in the audience and feel some questions, consider that call carefully, and, uh, <laughs> and then consider that person that's uh, made that call and think about are they going to be on your Christmas card list. So, so with that, I would like to say thanks for, for having us here. I would like to say thanks to my peers for for taking this on together, and I, I would like to say thanks to CSIS for having us. I think we should get something out of this next hour's conversation. I think it should be a two-way conversation. We'll give some, these opening remarks, and we should open it up, because we should leave with a better shared understanding of the challenges ahead. I, I really think uh, it's great to see these familiar faces in the audience, but I think if we don't leave with that shared understanding, we'll waste the opportunity. So why is FVL important to Special Operations Command? I think if we start by looking at the environment, you look at the risks, and, and you look at the way we should collaborate to, to address those risks, I think it'll paint a little bit better picture from the SOCOM perspective. So diffusion of power and technologies, I think uh, Buss just talked about that. We, we know that the world is, is not getting a, to be a more safer place. And we know that our near-peer competitors, regional rising states, and violent extremist organizations are all continuing to threaten our national interests. So we have to be cognizant that as we develop a new future vertical lift aircraft, that it can keep up with that environment. And really, we want to stay ahead of that environment. So fortunately, the, the investments that we made down at US SOCOM in the 1990s, uh, when DOD was actually in a drawdown period, those actually came to bear after the attacks of 9-11. So we were able to execute long-range assault and infiltration missions uh, through the mountains at night in Afghanistan, and we were only able to do that because we had invested in, in the equipment and the training to be able to do that, those missions. Uh, the MH-60 Kilo is a good example. Uh, that Black Hawk uh, led a lot of those missions, and we invested in those and fielded those in the 1990s. So looking at this, that history, how, how should we be prepared to look at it in the future? I think the, one of the enduring ways is to have better interdependence, better integration, better interoperability. I think those three tenets over the last 30 years, and particularly the last 15 years, have, have shown that we can't operate soft and conventional forces separated in space and time anymore. We have to operate together. We have to operate with nested operations. We have to operate with nested acquisitions. So integrating with the services in the past could be, conceived, could, could be perceived to be a challenge. But I think going forward, I think that's the right thing to do. And, and a couple examples of that I can call out specifically in recent history. The Army developed the UH-60 Mike model Blackhawk. They gave us that aircraft at SOCOM. We modified it with specific mission equipment to meet our mission requirements, and we fielded it as the MH-60M. 
Very similarly, the CH-47F Block II program that's underway with the Army and the RENEW program that's underway with the MH-47G, those two efforts are directly aligned, and the synergy there is already paying off in the development. So we have to keep up with the environment, and we have to learn a little bit from our history. We have to take these lessons that we've learned in the recent fielding of aircraft and actually employ them on this future vertical lift opportunity. We have to learn as much as we can from the flight tests that are coming up on JMR. I, I really believe that speed, range, and payload are achievable, and I think that the JMR flight tests down, uh, down at the two vendors that are building those aircraft are going to prove out the envelopes that are possible to get there. But I think the, the key point, and the key point I'd like to make, is that operational suitability is not just about speed, range, and payload. Operational suitability is, is really includes sustainability and survivability. And those are the kind of things that help build combat power for all of our forces, not just for SOCOM. So that combat power and the readiness that's driven by sustainability and survivability has to be up there on the, on the priority list, and we have to think through that carefully. I think after we get those five things, not just the top three, but all five, I think then we should fold that into carefully considering better mission equipment, better hardware, better software, better mission architectures, and, and really be those architectures be agile enough to keep up with the environment and to stay ahead of the environment. I said that earlier and I'll say it again. I think it's that important to stay ahead of the threats so we can maintain that comparative overmatch. In the past 20 years of mission equipment, there's been a lot of great opportunities, but it's littered with examples uh, where we didn't really live up to our expectations on open architecture systems. We've learned a lot. I think that learning is still going on in the S&T community. And I would challenge you if you're in industry and you're not familiar with the mission systems architecture demonstrations or the architecture implementation process demonstrations, if you're not familiar with those acronyms and those, uh, those programs, go out and get familiar with the Army S&T and the NAVAIR folks that are working on that. I think it's important. Because really our collective challenge are gonna, is going to be to prioritize those efforts along with the speed range and payload that we're going to see in the JMR TDs. For FEL to provide value to soft commanders, given its expected costs, it must provide those capabilities in all weather, all environments, and we have to be able to, to execute our missions when the enemy least expects it. Integrating open architectures with emerging sensor technologies is a way to do that, but it can't be cost prohibitive. It can't take too much time, and it can't cost too much money. So the bottom line, uh, SOCOM absolutely is lined up with the other services. We need an aircraft with range, speed, and payload. We need an aircraft that's survivable and sustainable. We shouldn't get focused on the architectures of today. We should look at the architectures of tomorrow. And we have to address the risks collectively in, in environments starting here, but in a lot of IPTs, and a lot of discussions with industry and, and keeping our operators involved in the process along the way to make the right decisions for FEL. Thanks again for having us here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Well, we'll start with a couple from down here. And, uh, uh, and by the way, as uh, I encourage the panelists to question each other if you would like. Uh, I don't know if I can get you to do that, but uh, we've had a couple events recently where I've had panelists uh, engaging directly with one another, it, it keeps things pretty lively. So uh, you're encouraged. Uh, I want to start on this issue a couple of you raised about the commonality of the requirement. Um, and I guess it's kind of a multi-part question, but uh, you know, there is a requirement that has gone through uh, the JROC, uh, but as, uh, as Colonel Bentley mentioned, that's really a starting point. You know, that's not the uh, that's an initial and early look at requirements. There's, there's quite a bit of requirements work still to do. Um, and the fact that the three of you are here today means that we're, I think, fairly well aligned across the services on this initial requirement. Um, uh, but then the question is, how do you stay aligned as the requirement you know, matures and, and grows more detailed? Uh, and uh, you know, it strikes me that there's maybe more differences between future vertical lift than where we were at the same point with Joint Strike Fighter than there are similarities, but it's obviously 
a program that comes to mind uh, as a major joint program where the services tried to align requirements uh, going forward. And, uh, and obviously that proved to be quite a challenge. Uh, and it turned out that there was less commonality between the various aircraft when they were finally produced than maybe had been you know, the notional perspective going in back in the 90s. So I just I would be interested in, in each of your thoughts on how do you maintain the commonality of the requirement as you get more detailed into some of the issues you all raised about deployability, ability to do mission upgrades. Uh, your thoughts on that? You know, th this is something that, um, you know, we're all looking toward and, and really what we've developed um, is I think a broad area of joint trade space that we've that we've noticed, and um, you know because really as we look at the the payload capability of the aircraft, we look at some of the um, speeds and ranges that we're looking for in a Cape Set three aircraft. Uh, there is actually a lot of alignment on the capabilities between the services. Um, we still have, a, as we said, a lot of work to do in that area. Um, but we, we've definitely identified the trade space that's there. And, and when it looks at uh, things like payload of the aircraft, um, even though the Army, Marine, and SOCOM requirement may be different in, say, number of soldiers or number of Marines on the aircraft, um, we can trade that payload for other things. For instance, we could trade part of that payload that the Army uses for soldiers into fuel to increase the range that the Marine Corps needs or that SOCOM needs. Um, the other thing as we look at um, the multi-service capability of the aircraft, there's a lot of components, a lot of dynamic expensive components that we could see using throughout the services. Um, you know, both, both our members here also mentioned the open architecture system. Uh, so there's great commonality there in a open architecture system across the services. So, <clears throat> you know, and to Colonel Bentley's point, you talk about uh, you know differences in requirements in trade space. You know, every requirement is a range, a threshold, a minimum that you think you need or that you assess as your need, an objective, your ultimate desire. Um, within that spectrum, whether it's from X speed to Y speed or X amount of troops to Y amount of troops, uh, that's kind of your trade space. And there's a lot of overlap in between there. Um, you know, to get, to get to as close to the perfect shared solution, uh, will there be compromise? Yeah, of course there will be. Uh, that's not a bad thing. I mean, because the reality is, uh, and Colonel Phillips touched on it, we're in a very fiscally constrained environment, and I think anyone who thinks that's gonna change radically for the better is probably fooling themselves. We need shared technology, we need shared systems, we need shared aviation supply and logistics. That, that's a reality. It's not just a fiscal reality, it's gonna be a battlefield reality. We're not gonna be able to sustain, move, supply multiple uh, unique systems across the services like we've done in the past. I think to think that we're gonna have that kind of flexibility or that degree of overmatch in the future, uh, yeah. I think that's, that's probably a, a wrong assumption. Uh, talking a little bit about, you know, so you, you touched on F-35, and I think it's an important, important, uh, important distinction to kind of make here, and, uh, and Colonel Bentley touched on it. And this is not meant as a, a criticism of F-35, but lessons learned. You know, this is a multi-service project versus joint. What does that mean? Is that just semantics? You know, we set up a joint program officer F-35, and that was kind of a, an unheard of creation, an amalgamation of the different services. Uh, very unique, it was not a construct that existed previously. Uh, when you do something new, you learn a lot of, there's a lot of lessons learned, and it becomes a little bit more difficult to leverage uh, existing relationships and structures that work well. Okay, that's not what we're doing here. Okay, this is an Army-led, Army program management-led program with participation from SOCOM and the Marine Corps. So we're using existing Army program management structure, existing NAV air support. We're, you know, we're not creating something new from scratch. Now, that in and of itself doesn't guarantee that it's more successful or it goes smoother than F-35 and the JPO. And F-35 is doing very well. I mean, the Marine Corps got one complete squadron already fielded. 
but this is a structure differently than F35 was. So yes, there are some similarities, but we've looked at those and tried to take some lessons learned from there um, and structure this a little bit differently. So I think the AOA is going to flesh a lot of that out. I think we're going to absolutely have the opportunity to think about that and to talk about that together with the services. Um, a good example, that's a really good example with the F-35. I think another good example for us in SOCOM has been the MH-60M and the CH-47, or the MH-47G. Uh, we made a, some hard decisions back in the early 2000s uh, to have a common set of mission equipment in that aircraft, those aircraft. And that, that decision was hard at first, and it required a lot of compromise, but we built in the flexibility and the ability to upgrade those systems. And, and now with common contracts, common sustainment tails, it's, that's really the way that we can efficiently operate the MH-47G and the MH-60M fleet today. And we ha if we hadn't made those hard decisions early, 15 years ago now, then we wouldn't be where we are today. Thanks. Um, a related question, but also uh, moving into kind of the next topic I wanted us to, to cover is um, the issue of threat and what's driving the need to get to a next generation of vertical lift systems. Um, and, and again, you all referenced this uh, to some extent in your remarks, just want to drill down a little bit deeper. And, and in particular, um, something you, uh, several of you mentioned is the, uh, you know, we focus on speed, range, lethality, uh, and those are wonderful and fantastic, and I wouldn't in any way minimize them, uh, and they have the potential to support new concepts of operations, as, as you mentioned, Colonel Bronco. But uh, so there's that piece that perhaps maybe will encourage uh, sustaining commonality, because my sense is, you can correct me, that the threat is, you know, or the pace of the threat uh, development is pretty consistent across the mission sets you're looking at. Um, but there's also this aspect of sustainability and adaptability. That, um, that we're hoping to have uh, in these new systems. So uh, if you could maybe talk a little bit about how that, um, how that need to get to a more sustainable fleet or set of, of fleets, uh, in the case or system of fleets, uh, and they build, need to adapt and how the threat uh, is, is moving in a way that's consistent or not consistent across the, the various mission sets you're looking at knowing that you can't get too much into threat in an unclassified environment, but. Uh. Thank you. Um, you. You know, one of the things as we, as we look at the future threat, and Colonel Bronco touched on it earlier, um, you know, obviously the speed and the range en enables us to stay outside of the threat envelope. But as we look at sustainment of the future aircraft um, and the ability to move a joint force into an area of operations, um, by interoperability through the services, by commonality, we're able to reduce our footprint. Um, we're looking to explore different types of interoperability where possibly we could share maintenance capabilities, not only the sustainment chain of um, parts and supplies, but also the ability for services to work on other services aircraft. I mean, we, we don't, we think nothing today of flying on another services aircraft. Um, we would probably want to explore um, joint sustainment. Um, you know, the other thing is we, and we've touched on the open architecture capability. Really that allows us to plug and play and rapidly innovate new technologies into the aircraft. Um, so if we go to a more of a you know, there's an app for that approach, or um, with resident firmware in hardware that's available, um, and we really define that open architecture system of how different capabilities can plug and play in the aircraft, how easily it is to update the aircraft. Um, and then one of the other opportunities is with a clean sheet design, we can design all this into the aircraft up front. Um, you know, we've had both in the H-1 fleets and the H-60 fleets over the last 30 plus years, we've experienced great growth and enhanced the capabilities of those aircraft. Uh, so with this in mind, we would go into capability set three, um, planning for that growth in the future. Uh, 
Yeah, that, that is an absolutely great point. And you know, you talk about the, the sustainability logistics footprint. Um, there's also a threat reduction piece to that. Okay. You look at the range and speed of our current rotary wing aircraft, the amount of FARPs, forward arming refueling points, or FOBs that you're going to need to sustain that across the battlefield. Okay, every one of those, obviously it's a logistics draw, but every one of those, particularly with some of the advanced systems that are out there, threat systems, is a target. Okay, it's a draw on manpower for force protection, it's a draw on other resources for air defense. Uh, every one of those is a target. So it's not just a draw on logistics, but this is also a way in which we reduce threat with the additional range and speed. Uh, you talk about open architecture. When you think about an all-networked aircraft that can easily share information, think Link, Link 16, but even more so. You know, the ability to share information. Uh, shared information, shared situational awareness is its own form of threat reduction. Okay, the ability to have this open architecture and have all of our aircraft linked, sharing threats, sharing friendly location, enemy locations, mission data, et cetera, real time, simultaneously on the battlefield, that is one of the greatest aircraft survivability equipment pieces, threat reduction things that we could possibly do. And that's not to say that we're not going to continue to invest in direct energy systems for counter IR missiles uh, and other counter radar systems. We are. But I can't think of no better way to reduce the threat in the modern environment than to be linked and have everyone be a network node sharing information. And I would argue that probably that capability, that kind of digital interoperability, that is probably our greatest overmatch right now against our opponents, potential opponents. Uh, you know, you look at some of our potential peer competitors out there, they make good hardware, they make very good TAC air jets, they make good rotary wing aircraft. But can they network them and share information real time on a battlefield like we have the potential to do? I'd argue no, they can't. I think that's probably our greatest potential overmatch. It's where we have our greatest advantage and we need to exploit that. And that's what we're building from the ground up with this system. Okay, and that, from Cape Set 3 to the whole family of systems, uh, some of it backward fitted to legacy aircraft, that's going to benefit all aircraft across the joint force. And that's really the direction that we need to go. And that's something we spent a lot of time in the Marine Corps. We are actually are building that network right now. Um, but what we're building right now is more of an ad hoc after the fact. What we're looking to do here with Cape Set 3 is to build from the ground up this digital interoperable you know, network where we're, all, uh, where we're all connected. So I think that's going to be a really a huge advance for us. So, so that is a good question. And I think the... The two points that, that the gentleman hit earlier, honestly, about sustainment and survivability are inextricably linked, right? So I think our sustainment in SOCOM is inextricably linked to the services. Today, we are absolutely tied to the Army uh, for some of our systems. We are actually tied to the Navy for some of our systems. Yeah. So I think uh, we've got some experience doing that on the sustainment side and on the survivability side, where we share a lot of lessons learned across the community. I think we got those doors open and we have to continue to share all those lessons learned and, and not forget them during the AOA. I think we can't get so focused, like we said, on uh, the tech demonstrators that we forget about the rest of the aircraft and the rest of the requirement. And I think those, uh, that focus, those discussions, uh, staying, staying focused on where the threat is going and trying to stay ahead of that is very important. And I've got one more question set, and then I'll, we'll turn to our audience. Uh, and I have to say, at these Future Vertical Lift events, there's probably as much or more audience knowledge in the audience as any other gathering that we tend to have here at CSIS, at least on vertical lift and, and some of the technical questions. Um, but the question, and, and I really think this is the issue that is probably going to be the most lively discussion um, this year on Capitol Hill and probably for a, a little set of years here, and, and probably has been already, is this issue of timeline uh, and uh, how this capability, this next gen vertical lift capability is going to uh, start to deliver into the operating force. Uh, so I'd just be interested in, in each of you just tackling, you know, how the, the timeline looks from your service perspective. You know, when, is, when does this need to deliver? Uh, Colonel, you already referenced a little bit about backward fitting some of the, some of the advances here to the existing force, which, is a key, which seems like a key point. Uh, if you could each talk a little bit about timeline. 
As we look at our Cape, C Cape Set 3 development, um, we're looking to get this capability into the force in the, uh, in the early 30s. Um, we've already mentioned we're currently involved in analysis of alternatives um, that's going to help us refine those capabilities. Um, and then starting in probably FY19, FY20, we're going to be making some decisions there on the multi-service aspect of the program, that joint trade space again, and we're going to continue ref to refine our requirements there. Um, you know, probably in the mid-20s, we're going to make a decision to go forward and build representative aircraft, um, our prototypes, and then we're going to look at a, a low-rate production um, of one of those prototypes in the late 20s. Uh, but I think the first time we're going to move into um, full-rate production would be in the, in the early 30s with getting this into the field shortly thereafter. How does it look from the Department of Navy perspective? <laughs> Uh, well, you're right, you're right. Probably a lot of the audience is extraordinarily knowledgeable. That's more so, I'm sure, than I am. That's why I have brilliant majors working for me, but uh, <laughs> which I actually do. As, same thing we view probably around early 2030s, 2033, uh, around that time uh, as when we, we first start to see fleet introduction. Uh, could that be earlier? It could be. I mean, it can always accelerate. It becomes a, it becomes a priority and the funding is there. Um, we, env we envision Cape Set 3 and the Marine Corps is replacing our, our HMLA, so our H1s, our AH1Z, our AH1 Yankee. Uh, those are relatively new aircraft, but we're planning ahead. And when you think about it, you know, the UH-1 Yankee, which I would first before the Zulu, uh, came into fleet introduction uh, in 2008. It's a 25-year airframe. So 2033, our oldest Yankees, will be hitting the end of their useful life and we'll be looking to replace them with FVL Cape Set 3, uh, the Zulu followed it two years later in 10, so in 35, uh, they'll start to be uh, hitting their end of their useful uh, airframe life and look to replace them. Um, that, that puts us in a quandary in the, in the interim because uh, for us, you know, MV-22 has really changed things in the Marine Corps. It's changed the game. One of the primary missions we used to do, I'm, I'm a Kerber pilot by trade, by MLS. Uh, that's my background, H-1Ws. I have flown the Zulu now for two hours. So I like to tell people I'm a Zulu pilot now. <laughs> Uh, well, one of our big missions was assault support escort, you know, was to escort the, the CH-46s. Uh, that's not a mission we can perform for the MV-22. We don't have the range and speed and capability to do that. Uh, we envision, though, FVL Cape Set 3 as being able to do that. That's one of the very important things for us as we look at this in the Marine Corps as we move forward with the analysis of alternatives. So I'll sound like a broken record a little bit, but we're absolutely tied to the Army on this. Our UH 60 M fleet that then became the MH 60 M fleet. Uh, we finished fielding those in 2015. And, and then we look at uh, 25 years from that, and that's where we're looking to absolutely line up with the Army and take those new future vertical lift Cape Set 3 aircraft, apply the same types of modifications that we needed to for our mission equipment packages as necessary. And, and really, in the interim, we're going to sustain our Little Bird fleet and our MH-47 fleet, we're investing in those now, so they will be relevant into the 2030s, and, and as long as we can keep them relevant until the next opportunity comes for the next capability set. All right, I do want to open up now to uh, audience questions. Uh, we'll have a mic brought to you, and uh, please just briefly state uh, your name, your affiliation if you have one, and, uh, and make it a question. So. Here, uh, I saw the first hand was right here. Uh, good morning, Otto Kreischer with Sea Power Magazine. This is for, for Colonel um, Barranco. Uh, where uh, in, in the lift reach and in, in troop capability are, are you looking at? You've, you've got the Ospreys, both of your mid, medium lift, uh, and then you're, you know, you're talking about phasing out your uh, Yankees, your H1s, uh, and you're bringing in the 53 kilos uh, for heavy lift, what reach, what range are, are you looking? Are you trying to do uh, uh, an H1 replacement or uh, heavier or longer? What, basically, what, what capability are you, you most needed for? Yes, sir, and, and that's a great question, and it's one that gets asked often. And, uh, you know, I think human, human nature is to, when you replace something, is to, we try to 
kind of pigeonhole, you know, the, the V-22 is a replacement for the H-46, our medium lift. And it's true, it did replace our H-46s. Um, but to compare, you know, the V-22 and its capability, its size, what it can carry to the H-46, it's, it's really not apples to apples. I mean, and we've got a very experienced V-22 pilot here, so I'll defer to Colonel Freeland, but I mean, in reality, we can, we can fit twice as many combat-loaded troops on a V-22 as we could on an H-46, and obviously the range and speed differences are, are well known, but, but I think a lot of people aren't aware of that, you know, that it, it's actually not an exact replacement medium lift, it's medium lift plus. You know, so as we look at replacing uh, the Yankee and the Zulu, you know, our initial going in, Cape Set 3, we thought, well, we'd like to be able to carry, you know, eight, eight people. We'd like to be able to carry eight Marines, eight soldiers. Um, that's a threshold. That's a threshold. You know, the Army looks at Cape Set 3 as being more of a replacement for H-60. Okay, H-60 was kind of comparable to H-46. Osprey is larger than both of those aircraft carries more people. Uh, FVL Cape Set 3, we look at it as a Yankee Zulu replacement. Yankee is a little bit smaller and carries less people than an H-60. Uh, this is where the trade space discussion comes in. You know, uh, if it carries 11 or 12 people and does the other things that the Marine Corps wants it to do, that's great. That's fine. We view that as a bonus. Now, like the Osprey replace, replacing the H-46, well, that, that's a larger payload. That's more troops. That's not an exact one-to-one, -one, apples-to-apples comparison or replacement. But that's all right. That's fine. Uh, we, you know, we, we would welcome that. I mean, if we were able to accomplish everything else we wanted to and have added capability to boot, that would be great. You know, eight, eight is a threshold requirement because that is a, a lift capability that is no less than what we have now with the added range and speed that we want. If we can get more of everything, that would be tremendous, and we welcome that. Uh, and so we present that challenge to industry. <laughs> I hope that answers your question, sir. Obviously, cost will be a key factor there uh, if you're replacing. To, it needs to be in a cost range that, that matches the need there, too. Hi, Sam Arbel, Stark Aerospace. Could you address the integration of manned unmanned teaming and organic off-board sensing EW capabilities from the unmanned aspect? So our current uh, manned to man teaming capabilities um, you know, we're, we're utilizing that, obviously, in our attack aircraft and also um, in our utility aircraft. We see the ability to expand that capability um, in order to not only or really expand on the capability that we have in the Apache to control different aircraft. Um, we see that requirement throughout the FEL family of systems, specifically cap capability set three. Uh, so we definitely want to continue to explore that. Um, in line with man to man teaming, we want to explore the capability to optimally crew the vehicle. Um, you know, do we see FVL aircraft, you know, obviously uh, controlling other aircraft with the potential of controlling FVL aircraft in the future? We do. Um, but this is one of the areas that we, we really want to explore and see what the capabilities are. Uh, so it goes much further than man-to-man -man teaming. Um, it gets into, as we said, the optimally crewed capability of how different missions could require different crews um, and just really continue to explore that and, and what are the potentials there. Um, as far as advanced sensors, obviously that is something that's in development um, and it goes back to the open architecture. The ability in the joint trade space across the services to use the same architecture, to use different sensors for the services uh, based on the different mission requirements and things of that nature. That's where we really see the development of that going. I completely agree. It kills me to admit this. The Army is, is ahead of us on man on man teaming. Um, you guys are. There's no question about it. Um, we do do some of it in the Marine Corps. We have not taken it to the degree uh, for that the Army has. Uh, that is absolutely one of our goals uh, in the future. Uh, it's something we're working right now on a kind of a, an off-airframe kneeboard solution. 
um, because we don't have the open architecture systems in our existing legacy platforms that we're building into FEL Cape Set 3. Uh, but we absolutely want it built into Cape Set 3. Uh, the optionally manned capability, there are systems out there uh, that will allow, allow you to do that now. Uh, the Marine Corps is developing a, a Group 5 shipboard VTOL um, UAS right now uh, that we envision as being partnered with FEL Cape Set 3. Uh, so we look at them as be working very closely in tandem and parallel uh, as we move forward. You know, on the sensor piece, uh, you know, the other thing, and there are systems out there now, and I don't know how specific it can be, so I'm, I'm going to avoid, avoid getting too specific, but there are systems out there now uh, that exist, open architecture, waveform independent or waveform uh, non-discriminant. You can take data from any waveform uh, that will allow us to do sensor fusion. You know, allow us, whatever our onboard sensor is on FVL Cape Set 3, uh, to send to other users, and they can fuse with what they are seeing in their cockpit and what they're getting from all other users on the network, you know, so that you can have, either built in the cockpit on your electronic kneeboard, a fused sensor, sensor pic picture from across the spectrum of users in the joint force uh, for any objective area target area that you're interested in. And there are systems right now that have that capability, and we're looking to... Uh, incorporate that in Cape Set 3. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm, <coughs> excuse me, Richard Whittle. I uh, write for BreakingDefense.com. And um, uh, everybody here probably sees the need for future vertical lift. Uh, uh, some may think it's more urgent than others because taking another 15 years to get the aircraft into the fleet doesn't really seem realistic in the 21st century. But that said, uh, you, it, it, there's a new sheriff coming to town. There's, you know, uh, everybody's expecting the restraints to come off that have been on defense spending. Uh, the services presumably will get more money uh, sometime soon. But within yours, what I'd like to understand or, or get your views on is within your services, the, how widely shared is the interest in this program? How, how widely appreciated is, are the benefits? Because I have heard Army officers uh, cast doubt on the idea that you need anything faster than a Black Hawk or an Apache. Uh, I think the Marine Corps uh, has, has developed a different attitude with the B-22. But so I'm curious to, to know, you know, there's still gonna be a limited pot of money, doesn't matter what, uh, the new president and the new Congress do. Uh, so how much of it can you really expect to get? How much, what, what priority is there within the services for future vertical lift? Let me, let me just make one comment before I turn it over to the panel that the people you really want to hear from. But uh, a lot of the work that we've done in CSIS recently has looked at the question of what I would call the pipeline. Um, and what's very notable about the pipeline, certainly for vertical lift uh, up, to, up to now, uh, and to some extent for each of the services, most acutely for the Army, is that the pipeline is pretty empty. So the question of uh, bringing forward capability, uh, you gotta have something in the works. Uh, you know, I, I, my friend uh, General Cody talks about uh, when he was uh, the vice chief and all of a sudden they were in a shooting war what he was able to do was move a lot of combat capability to the field because it had been in development and there was something to accelerate. If there's nothing to accelerate if you're starting from scratch, you know, it's gonna take a long time no matter what you do and no matter how much of a priority you put on it. Um, so, yeah. So uh, let me let you hear from the panel. Thank you, and, and that was a very good point. And, and really, as we move forward with FEL, it is about having something in the pipe there and, and ready to move forward with. Um, you know, from a Army's perspective, we do have a requirement for increased capability, uh, speed, range, payload, endurance. Um, we have some very capable aircraft in the fleet right now. And, and so it is a, a balance between maintaining the relevancy of those aircraft that are going to be in the fleet for a while, but at the same time pursuing new capabilities uh, that is going to give the Army um, a operational maneuver capability and a strategic deployment capability. Um, 
you know, what capabilities the Army chooses to um, pursue, uh, that is well above my pay grade as a, as a requirements developer. Um, you know, we are charged with talking to um, our users and, and developing a capability that we have sitting there in the pipeline ready to go. Um, so it, it, so as, as far as, you know, looking at the Army capabilities, we have a very capable fleet. We need to maintain that capability. But also we have a requirement for the future to enhance that capability through FVL. So I can add on to that just a little bit from the SOCOM perspective. I think we have to look at what are the priorities now and what are the priorities in the future. And I think wise investments, as we watch what, as the Army leads the effort, those wise investments could really pay off in the future. And I think there's a recognition of that within SOCOM, and you asked specifically about the interest and the benefits. There's definitely interest and there's definitely benefits, but I think the timing of the investments is what's going to matter once we see where the technology is with the demonstrators. Back here on the, uh, on the aisle. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. Um, no, I mean, your, your question, sir, about, you know, you hear different, what's the commitment of the Marine Corps, you hear different voices in the Army. Um, that's good, it's natural. I mean, we, we, everyone within the services welcomes different opinions. Uh, we're building doctrine for the future. And as we have always done, you know, we are, we are coming out of a war, in this case, over a decade plus of war. Uh, and it was a, you know, a relatively low intensity counterinsurgency effort. Um, and we have a tendency to rehash, refight the last war. And we're looking forward with emerging technologies, emerging threats, um, re emerging potential peer competitors. And yes, are there differing opinions and are strategies and opinions continuing to form? They are. They are. I mean, we are trying to develop our doctrine, our concepts for the future. And as always, you know, the, the future is unknown. Uh, so, uh, yes, I think you, <clears throat> there are different perspectives in the services uh, and within the respective services. Uh, but right now, uh, the commitment to FEL within the Army, SOCOM, and the Marine Corps, uh, Cape Set 3 is very strong. And, uh, I, you know, I anticipate us continuing to move forward as a doctrine continues to, to form. Uh, and whatever that finally looks like, we know that the threat is growing and the capability that we're going to need in the future is going to be more than we have now. That much we all agree on. You know, the nuances of, of where the trade space is and what, what the final FEL CAPE set 3 looks like and family system looks like, um, I, I don't want to say that those are small details. They're not. Uh, but we all know that we need to advance our capabilities. That, that we agree on. So I don't, know if that, I don't know if that was out of the park, but if you, if you need. I can't resist making one other point that, that really came up from, from what you were saying. We had an event here yesterday with, uh, on, focused on innovation, and Dr. Prabhakar from DARPA was one of the panelists, and she made the point that uh, really uh, sort of game-changing innovation, a lot of times it's not about changing a specific technology or a specific uh, system. It's about a new architecture that enables an entirely new set of of capabilities, new concepts. Uh, and, and so one of the things that strikes me about Future Vertical Lift is it's very explicitly an effort to create this new, an entirely new architecture. So uh, obviously, you know, it's too early to speak to the success of that and what it's going to enable. But uh, now that's not to say that, uh, you know, you couldn't take aspects of it, pull it forward, buy them sooner. Uh, but uh, unless you envision and then try to reach to that new architecture, you know, you're not going to maybe make as much of a game-changing shift as you set out to do. That's, that's, I think, a point that was made yesterday I just wanted to, to raise. Here. Good morning. Uh, Kevin Christensen with Lockheed Martin. A uh, question really for the Army and relates to the armed variant for capability set three. Uh, will that be in play for the AOA? Uh, and if the Army does not pursue a, an attack variant, do you think that capability set one or some other type of mitigating capability uh, will be envisioned to cover air assault security that the Army will need uh, when it fields a much faster uh, assault platform that uh, its legacy uh, security platforms will be able to keep up with? Thanks, Kevin. That's a good question. 
<laughs> and, and, and probably one of the, uh, the more uh, interesting topics. The, uh, you know, right now the Army's focus for capability set three is the utility mission. Um, and so once again focused on the air assault medevac capability. Um, we see that as, as the greatest, once again, joint need. Um, we have some additional study to do and work on where we see the next platform coming from, or the next attack platform coming from. Um, it, we definitely want to explore um, the Marine approach to Capability Set 3 as an attack platform. Um, and we definitely want to explore um, possibly a smaller airframe as an attack platform. Uh, you know, the, the Army has maintained a need um, for wide area security, a requirement there. Um, obviously, that could be answered by either a um, possible, you know, Apache attack FVL replacement, um, or it could be answered by a smaller aircraft more along the lines of the OH-58 uh, KW. Uh, the short answer, though, is we've got a lot more work to do. Um, whether that will be a um, possibly a, you know, the Marine approach to the attack aircraft, whether it could be a kitted solution to the utility aircraft in a Cape Set 3 variety, or um, we have not ruled out the possibility once again of the smaller aircraft in a more of armed reconnaissance light attack role. Um, we look forward to the work that we've got to do on that and also the Army's decision of how we're going to pursue that capability. I am Dave Inlet, just consult independently. Uh, appreciate your comments and uh, your, your mention of the early 30s time horizon. You mentioned an AOA and talking to the users uh, and your aspiration for technology and netting. With that kind of a horizon, can you speak about how you're engaged in industry in the labs and the university infrastructure at this time of the program's progress to make sure you don't leave something on the table or don't overreach. And I know you're investing in tech demos, but could you go beyond what you've invested in for your demonstrators to how, what's your method or mechanism for that engagement to inform your requirements? Well, we've, had, um, to expand a little bit on the tech demo, you know, there's, there's two major components of the JMR tech demo program. Um, obviously, we have the aircraft demonstration component where we're looking at um, FVL technologies, but also, and we've already talked about the open architecture. So the second part of the JMRTD program is the open architecture. Um, you know, underneath the um, flight demonstration, we have four contracts with industry uh, to develop um, either flying models or models for wind tunnels. I think we... Um, I don't know the exact number underneath the architecture demonstration portion, but I think there's uh, eight or ten contracts there involving industry. Uh, you know, industry has done a phenomenal job of uh, engaging the government through um, the Vertical Lift Consortium, the VLC, uh, where we've had one-on-one -on -one interaction. Um, the other approach that we've used is through our request for information, RFI and receiving industry feedback there. Uh, specifically on uh, the FVL program, we've had two RFIs on Cape Set 3, and we've also had an RFI on uh, Cape Set 1. I believe we had um, eight respondents to our initial Cape Set 3 RFI, and we had six responders to our Cape Set 1 RFI. Uh, and w we still have our second Cape Set 3 RFI that is out to industry right now for comment. Um, so we've had a lot of engagement there, uh, and then also through forums like this um, and exchange. And, and we're also in contact with um, institutions as far as the colleges and other institutions for development of those capabilities. So I think we have a very broad uh, net. Um, whether or not we want to be able to capture everything, I, I think that remains to be seen. So I can speak to some of the venues that SOCOM uses. Um, we have the traditional venues, and we absolutely leverage the Army's S&T efforts. Uh, we have our own S&T there at SOF ATNL that we leverage. We have broad area announcements. We have a lot of SIPRs and, and great ideas coming out of that S&T community within SOF. 
Um, but we've also established another venue out off of uh, McDill, and that's called Softworks. Uh, it's another opportunity to collaborate where industry and, and government and operators can come together. And, and for example, uh, we absolutely looked at uh, our own architecture that we have in the aircraft today recently. So we held an event where we invited academia, industry, operators, and we said, come in, let's collaborate, let's talk about this, just to determine, even with the aircraft that we're sustaining, how should we sustain those until the 2030, 2040 timeframe with architectures? And then how could that inform what we do for future vertical lift? All right, well, we, we got to all the hands that I saw, and we are at the end of our hour. Uh, so I want to thank our, our audience coming and for asking great questions and being very uh, attentive. And uh, uh, keep your eyes peeled for future events on future vertical lift. Uh, we, we do expect uh, the series definitely will continue into next year, uh, and we'll have something, uh, I'm sure, in the spring. And please join me in thanking our panel for a great presentation. Thank you.